gratitude. We're talking about living with a great big thank you in our life. And one of the things that we see in our culture is we have a culture that is not very grateful right? And we see it's easy for us to point at the sin issues of our culture. It's easy, it's easy to point at the greed and the envy and the angry and the sexual identity issues and, and all the issues that we struggle with with our culture. But Romans chapter 1, I would fi- in fact, I would encourage you to get into Romans chapter 1 and read about the culture that, that Paul is dealing with there in the book of Romans. It, it looks a lot like 2018 in America. Let's just say that. I would encourage you to spend some time in there this week. And he, start, and he says this in Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 21, he says, they knew God, or like they knew who God was, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And I think that that's interesting, that it's not just, it's not just a worship issue, it's also a gratefulness issue, a gratefulness to God. And then it says this is what happens, that they began to think up foolish ideas of what God is like. And there are foolish ideas in our culture of what God is like. And he says this because they have a poor image of God, because their their minds are so jacked up and they have this foolish image of what God is. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. So there's darkness and there's confusion. I think some of that could be repaired if we would learn to worship God for who he is, not what we've projected on him, but worship him for who he is and be thankful. And so that's what we've been talking about on this series about nurturing that gratitude. And today I want to talk about really the posture of gratitude. We've been we've been really talking about that the whole series, but really like what does it look like for me to be a person that has a great big thank you? What does it look like for me to have a posture of thankfulness? Not just a moment of thankfulness, not just a day of the year that we celebrate and we we're thankful. No, 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 a lifestyle, a posture of gratitude. Luke chapter 7, amazing story. One of the Pharisees, Luke chapter 7, verse 36, one of the Pharisees, his name was Simon. Everybody say Simon. Y'all introduce you guys to Simon here. Simon asked Jesus, a Pharisee asked Jesus to dinner with him. I mean, know that Jesus was even willing, come on, to go to dinner Go to supper over at the religious person's house. And many people say, no, Jesus didn't like have anything to do with religious people. No, no, no. Jesus went to his house. So he went into his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman, now, now most people believe that this woman was a prostitute, an immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Let me tell you about how expensive this jar was. This jar was worth a year's wages. So somewhere between an average income of today, somewhere between thirty and $60,000 a jar of perfume. Now, I don't know how she got that, probably from her immoral lifestyle, but she had obviously been saving this for a moment. And she brought this jar into the house, and then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell at his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. So she just begins to pour the oil, this, this, this perfume, on the feet of Jesus. And when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, now he didn't say it verbally, he was just thinking it, if this man were a prophet, He would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. You ever thought that about somebody before? When somebody's lavishing love on Jesus and you thought, who do they think they are? They're a sinner. They could sell that perfume and give the money to the poor. Right? She's a sinner. Then Jesus, check this out. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. He didn't answer his words. He he answered his thoughts because he never said anything, but Jesus knew what he was thinking. So Jesus answered his thoughts. Isn't it crazy? Have you ever had the Lord answer your thoughts? You need to stop thinking that way, son. You need to stop thinking that way, daughter. He wants to answer your thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other, but neither of them 
could repay him. So he kindly forgave both of them, canceling their debts. How many know that you have a debt you can't pay? There's a debt in your life. It's called a sin debt. I'm not talking about compared to the God down the street. I'm talking about your righteousness compared to God's righteousness. You have a debt that you can't pay. Yet God, who is kind and generous, knows that you can't pay that debt. So he sent Jesus to pay the debt, to pay the penalty, to pay the price for the things that you committed. Your debt. He came to get you out of debt. Some of y'all say, yeah. Come on. And he's really talking about the sin debt. Canceling the debt. Who do you suppose loves more after that? And Simon answered, I suppose. Well, I guess. The one for whom he canceled the larger debt, the 500 silver person. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here when I entered your home. You didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but when she was, she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You see, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, and she has anointed my feet with rare, expensive perfume. I tell you, her sins and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. Everybody say much love. But a person who is forgiven little only shows a little love. But Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The man at the table, the men at the table, again, religious people, said to themselves, who is this man that goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus looks at the woman and says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. And sometimes when I read that story, I, I think is with the, five, with the 500 versus the 50, is, is, is Simon the one with 50 and the woman 500? Or is Simon, come on, the one with 500 and the woman 50. I do know this. This woman was grateful that Jesus, the only one who can forgive sins, was willing to forgive her sins, but not just to forgive her sins, but to declare peace over her. Go in peace. How many of you would love to go in peace? You would love for peace to govern your life, right? Not a, not a circumstance govern your life, Come on, not a job govern your life, not a situation, not an upbringing govern your life, but how many of you would like to have peace govern your life? I think we could all use a little more peace. So it says this in Philippians chapter 4, to rejoice in the Lord always. How often? Let's talk about posture. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, now, rejoice already is a word that means do it again, right? Rejoice, not just joyce. It doesn't say joyce in the Lord, right? No, it says rejoice, which means do it again. And then he says, do it again always. <laughs> so always doing it again. Doing what again? Rejoicing, celebrating, having joy in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. So he's like, if you don't get the word rejoice, <laughs> right? I say do it again. Always. Do it. Rejoice. The emphasis, rejoice. So one of the things that I've been learning is whenever I sit before the Lord and I just express gratitude, and it could be it could be for a very complex thing, a simple, and the first thing that always comes to my mind is my forgiveness. Come on. For me, I'm, the, the first thing is when I, when I approach the Father, the first thing that I always say, Lord, I thank you for Jesus. Lord, I'm so grateful that Jesus came. I'm so grateful that when I was 18 years old and unfit for you, Lord, you saw me as worthy. Lord, you liked me and you loved me and you wanted me. Lord, I'm so grateful that you wanted. And what I've noticed is as I began to rejoice in that and I began to express gratitude, I've I've noticed that sometimes I kind of have a list of things to be thankful for. Do you you have a list? Maybe not on paper, but you have it somewhere like in your mind. And I start thinking. And as I go down the list, one of the things that I notice is when it seems like I get to the bottom of the list, the list just got longer. 
And sometimes I've found that whenever I go down the list of the things that I'm grateful for, I look back up and I go, oh yeah, I'm still grateful for number one. What am I doing? I'm rejoicing. See, the, the spirit of thankfulness, that great big thank you. We talked about this at our leadership meeting also on, on Sunday night. The thank, thankfulness kind of puts a, 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 a vacuum inside of us where it's just like, God, I thank you. Oh, and, and Lord, I thank you for that. But some of you have never entered that vacuum because you haven't really taken the time to sit down and check out of what's going on and just check in to what God has done and what God is saying. And I would invite you to, to enter into that rejoicing always, that it becomes, becomes a staple on your lifestyle, that it becomes part of your posture. Then he says this in verse 5, let your gentleness, and I believe he begins to show us what it looks like when this is active in our life. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Mm. I mean, no, that's not just a command of you. It's a command for you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So when we get our prayers together, we don't come together with our prayers with frustration. Lord, I, this isn't right. This person didn't treat me like that. I don't like my job that I agreed to. I don't like that, 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 right? go through our list. He's saying, don't go through your list that way. When you pray and petition, do it with what? Thanksgiving. God, I'm thank you. Thank, 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 thankful that I have a job. I'm a little frustrated at my job right now, Lord, but I'm so grateful I have one. Would you make some adjustments there? Would you adjust me there? Present your request to God. And then it says, this, this is what happens. This is what happens when we have that kind of posture and the peace of God. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It'll change the way you feel. It'll change the way you're motivated. It'll change the way you think. What will? Being grateful. Exercising gratitude. See, most of us say, and we've talked about this a lot in our series, I'll be grateful when it happens. No, no, no. You be grateful then it happens. You'd be grateful if it never happens. You've got much to be grateful for. Why? Because just like that woman, much has been forgiven. See, our, our posture of gratefulness will increase our capacity to walk in peace. On good days, on bad days, through suffering, through scoffing, come on, through stress, through stupidity, On good days and bad days, there's always something to be grateful for. And when we practice gratitude, you watch peace begin to happen. You know, we get all the time. I have to pray peace over people all the time. It's probably one of the one of the most common prayers that we get. Man, I just I just need peace in the situation. I need peace in the circumstances. Yes. And so I always pray that. So pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, just pray that the peace that transcends all understanding will guard the heart of mine. I pray that prayer right there. It's awesome to pray the Bible. Amen. It's not just a book we read, it's a book we pray. And so I pray as the Lord, I just pray that'll happen. But let me tell you something. I can pray that all day long, but if they are not practicing what's before that, I can't expect that prayer to be answered. Listen, don't wait for peace before you change your attitude. Change your attitude and then experience peace. See, th- there are these, these postures that we have, these negative postures that stifle gratefulness, right? That, s- that stifle the thank you, right? We know them. We know some of them. Let's talk about them. They're, they're, they're all negative, by the way. They're all, they're all negative. Ne- negativity comes out of those, let me just say this, negativity comes out of those that have not nurtured an internal culture of gratitude. It's an internal culture of gratitude, not an external. Come on. He knows your thoughts. So some people would say, well, I'm just not optimistic. I'm a realist. Well, reality is you've got it really good. That is not the way I am. I'm just not a positive person. Isn't that what we do? All the time. In our weakness, we always do that. Right? We always go, well, that's the way I am. But last time I checked, Jesus came and died to change the way that you were. So to say, when we protest, that's the way I am, we are resisting the lordship of Jesus. 
We're saying, Lord, the, the life that you've chosen for me, the life that you want me to live is not good enough. I want to be who I am. And we're so married to this God called I. Don't resist the Lordship of Jesus. So maybe you do have reasons for your negativity. But beloved, I tell you, there are reasons for you to be grateful. There, there are reasons for you to be hopeful. What are, what are some of these mentalities that stifle gratefulness? Number one is entitlement. Oh, come on. It's, it's 2018. We've all seen the memes. Let me say this about entitlement. What you are entitled to is so much less than what God has promised. So much more. So much more. See, what you deserve is not very much. It's just not very much. That's why this woman could take a year's wages and put it at the feet of Jesus. Because she realized that, that that moment was way better than the last year that she had spent earning that money. See, you can choose the grace of God, which empowers you to receive his promise, or you can receive what you're privileged to or what you deserve. See, we've got all these complaints. Well, if the government would do this, if my wife would do this, if my job would do this, I deserve better. Well, we can talk about what you deserve. We're not going to today. But you can rely on what you deserve, what you're entitled to, or you can receive the grace of God, which will give you way, way more and better and things that are more substantive than the things that you're desiring. So don't get locked into entitlement. The second thing is victimhood. Victimhood will stifle gratefulness. Well, just the way I was raised. Mama, blah, blah, blah. Right? Why is everything rotten in my life? Why is life so difficult? My life so difficult. Why is this happening to me? Do you see? The reason is because you were at the center. Complainers, let me, let me tell you this. Complainers are drainers. Complainers are drainers. And what, what typically what, what we see is when people complain is they want attention, right? We, we want someone to tell us, it's going to be okay. But what ends up happening is we do get attention, but it's not that kind of attention we seek. In fact, what happens instead of getting attention, we actually get put in detention from people because nobody wants to be around you because complainers are drainers. So the people that you need to help you walk through life when it's hard, you've excommunicated them by your negativity. By being a victim. Oh, my life is different. If you want to it's Listen, we've all had bad things happen to us, but we are not a victim of our situations. We are not victims of our circumstances. Listen, this is the good news. God loves you. God wants you. Jesus came and died for you. You are not a victim. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says you are more than a conqueror. All you do is win, 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 win. That's all you do. You're an overachiever in Christ. All you do is win. So stop counting your losses and count your wins. You are not a victim. Number three, the poverty mindset. What is that? Well, the poverty mindset runs with the orphan mindset. Because the poverty mindset is driven by fear. If I do this, if I celebrate what God's doing in somebody else, there won't be enough for me. So we can't live generous. Why? Because we're living by fear. We're saying there is not enough. What is that? Poverty mindset. We don't compliment someone if somebody else does something good because we're afraid if they get promoted, we won't get promoted. That's a poverty mindset. So you can't celebrate other people. You can't celebrate the wins in other people's lives because they have what you want. Listen, you want freedom in your life? Learn to pray for and celebrate what you want in somebody else. That'll set you free. That'll give you peace. Get over that poverty mindset. You're always aware. Poverty mindset is always aware of my lack. Well, I can't do anything. Someone would just give me a chance. You know, I've known people that have been given thousands of chances that make that statement. They've lived their lives by that statement. And I've watched chance after chance. I was like, man, if I would have had that opportunity, darn. Sometimes you just got to make opportunity. Listen, beloved, you don't have to act like a poor, poverty-driven orphan because that's not who you are. You belong to a good, benevolent, kind, heavenly father. He has put in you so much more than you could ever express in this entire life. He has given you so much. Allow that to just break. The spirit of adoption breaks the spirit of fear. 
Number four, the fourth, fourth thing is this, is, is greed and materialism. Greed and materialism. See, the problem with money, people say money's the root of all evil. No, no, no. The love of money is the root of all kinds. There's nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with having things. The problem is, is when money or things have you. That's the problem. See, the, the problem with money is it nurtures independence. Right? You, it, I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? Every investment. Don't you want independence? Don't you want security? Don't you want happiness? See, money always promises what it can't provide. Money promises what only God can provide. Only God can provide security. Only God can provide happiness. Only God can provide peace. Money can't provide those things. Don't believe the lie. I, I'm learning with my money to live with an open hand. Open to give and open to receive. Come on. Many of us are open to receive, but we're not open to give. That means your hand's closed. You're not going to receive that much. Because we know from last week, those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Mm -hmm. Don't believe the law of materialism that if you have more, you'll be happy. He who dies of the most toys still dies, beloved. Number five, offense or unforgiveness. The mantra of the age, I'm offended. It seems like, it seems like what we've done in our culture is we said, whoever is the most offended is correct. Well, I'm more offended than you are. Who cares? I don't care if you're offended. I mean, I care because it's, it's separating you from God. Offense does separate you from God. Unforgiveness does separate you from God. I'll show you in the scriptures. Offense is the posture of those that are in bondage. You might not be in bondage to a chemical, but you're in bondage emotionally. I'm convinced that those who want to withhold forgiveness or harbor offense simply don't understand the forgiveness of Christ. If you can't forgive someone, then it's because you don't understand God's forgiveness. We're not talking about a, a person forgiving a person. We're talking about God forgiving a human. It's huge. So if God can do that, I can forgive anybody really of anything. And nothing will hinder your prayers like unforgiveness. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus shares this. He says, listen, if you come to the altar and you have offense in your heart towards someone, then what you should do is you should just leave your gift there, get out of God's presence, go and reconcile with your brother, and then come back. Get your heart right. So, those are some things. Those are, those are preaching, preaching for you today. Listen, but how do you practice the posture of gratitude? We talked about the things that will hinder. How do we practice the posture of gratitude? See, the, this is the deal. The economy of our heart is revealed in the posture of our gratitude. That's how we know how, how good our heart is. How grateful are we? And it's also how we invest in the economy of our heart, is by exercising gratefulness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 Let, everybody say let. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We talked about that, being governed by peace, right? We let it happen. How does it happen? Well, we'll talk about it. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. So peace is something we're called to, but it's also available to us. God wants you to live at peace. It's God's will that you live at peace. And be thankful. See, these two things are linked again, together. Let the Word, and he gives us some practicals. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Everybody say absorb. Let the Word of Christ absorb or dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing. Everybody say sing. How about everybody say sing? All right, so sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude. Let me hear you say gratitude. With gratitudes in your hearts to God. So he's saying, say these things. Don't just play lip service. Let it, let it well up in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Do you see it's this big circle of thanks? And we just have these moments in the middle, and we say, this is how I get there. This is how I live from the moment. 
It's just a cycle of thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, right? So number one, absorb. Everybody say absorb. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, some of you have don't have peace in your life just because you won't get into the word. You have got to get into the word until the word gets into you, right? Get into the word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When we have group, community group at our house, one of the things that people are like, do y'all do a Bible study? No, we don't do a Bible study. Well, they're kind of like, you know, people that have been in church for a while, they kind of act like we're unspiritual. It's like, no, we believe that the word of Christ dwells in us richly. And we just hang out together and we're encouraged by what? By the word of Christ that's in Benny. So I can just be around Benny. He don't even have to break out the Bible, but because he's been in the word and the word is in him, we're sharing together and the word's getting in me. So one of the ways that we, that we get into the words of Christ is just by being in community and doing life together. So get into the word until the word gets into you. Absorb it. Number two, adore. So, and let me just say this about the words of Christ. What does Jesus say about you? What does Jesus, do you know what Jesus says? It's funny, we have a culture that's like, oh, Jesus, Jesus wouldn't do that, and Jesus would do this, and they're all like talking about Jesus. They don't even know Jesus. I'm like, why are you talking about Jesus? You don't even know Jesus. It only cares when it fits your platform. That's the only time you ever care. The only time you ever care whenever you feel like it'll promote your agenda. Why don't you show, quit talking about Jesus and let somebody that knows Jesus talk about Jesus? How about let's read the Bible, what the Bible says about Jesus. I mean, that's kind of the authority. I mean, it's kind of what we learn about Jesus is from the Bible. Jeez. Well, I kind of think, I don't care what you think. I want to know what the Word says. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. What does he say? And listen, what does he say about you? Now, some of you have a broken mindset because you think everything that he says about you is negative. That's not true. He sees you as worthy. Come on, he sees you as worth it. He sees you as incredibly valuable. Come on. I mean, he died for you. He's not mad at you. He's not, he's not in heaven with a gavel going, let's, let's wait for him to mess up again. No, he's like, come on. Let's do this. I know you're weak. Let me help you. What does he say about you? What is posture towards you? Absorb in that. Number two, adore him. So what does he say about you? And what do you say about him? Adore him with your praise. Come on. Your thanks is what it talks about here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you who belong in Jesus. Typically, when we ask about the will of God, we're asking about position, where I'm at in life, right? You guys tracking with me? Lord, I want your will. I want to be where you want me to be. Scripturally, what we see most of the time when it's talking about the will of God it's not about position, it's about posture. So are you praying, Lord, why do you want my, your will to look like in my life? I'm angry because this person offended me. I'm angry because they did them wrong. What is your will? Your will is to be, your, God's will for your life is for you to be thankful. In all circumstances. Oh, it's hard, but it's God's will. You don't even have to pray about it. Lord, is it your will that I'll be nice? Yes. So you might have to pray where you're going to move or the job you're going to take. You don't have to pray about being nice. You don't have to pray about having a good attitude. You already know it's the will of God. So he talks about this, and he, and he says, he says, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, doesn't he? Listen, one of the things that I'm learning, and I had a moment yesterday. I don't want to get into it because of time. But let's just say that I was frustrated <laughs> at Leslie. Can you believe that? I mean, seriously? I know y'all are getting offended. Hold up. Hold on with me. And so I'm all frustrated with her. I wasn't really frustrated at her. I was just frustrated from my day. And that's taken out on her. And so I was in the garage, and I was doing a little bit of work in the garage. And the Holy Spirit started speaking to me. You know what I found? I found the melody in the moment. The melody in the moment was I'm grateful for my amazing wife. The melody in the moment was God is good to me. Look how he's blessed me. Why, do, why, am I, why am I grumpy? Why am I complaining? I've got it really good. All I do is win. So about two minutes later, I'm, baby, I'm sorry for being grumpy. All right. Thank you for apologizing. We don't ever, when, when one of us is wrong and we apologize to the other one, a little marriage advice for you, we don't say it's okay. We say thank you for apologizing. Because it wasn't okay that I was grumpy. I'll help you. That'll help you. 
But one of the things that you've got to learn to do, beloved, when it's tentious, whether it's a moment like that, whether it's a moment at work, whether it's a, a moment with you, in your life, whether it's a season in your life, you just got to learn to find the melody in the moment. What, what melody in the moment is there? What is God saying in the moment? What is God doing in the moment? And sing that. What's the melody in the moment? Find the melody in the moment because there's a melody there. What's the melody? The melody is this. God is good. God is good. What's the melody of the moment? The melody of the moment is God is good. The melody of the moment is not, oh, man, my job is a bleep, bleep, bleep. My, my situation, bleep, bleep, my spouse is bleep. No, no, no. The melody of the moment is God is good, and he's a good provider, and he's a good lover, and he's a good, he's a good, good, good to me with provision. He takes good care of me. He's providential. He looks after my life. He's, he's a God of promise. He gives, gives me hope, and I can just sing out, God is good. You might not know anything else to sing. You might just say, God is good. God is good. You may have to take a rob a melody from another song, some, like, you know, pagan song that has bad words in it. You just, you just take that song, and you sing, God is good. I can't think of any songs right now because I don't fill my mind with that garbage. So um, that's, that, was, that was a little joke. I know that I think I was preaching kind of was. But find the melody in the moment. Every moment has a melody. Will you find it? Go after it. Even if you don't sing good, find it. Go get in your car, shut the door, and find the melody in the moment. Don't even put a tape on. Don't put anything to lead you there. Just go, God, where are you? I want to experience your goodness right now. I know you're good. I know. Oh, boom. There it is. You're having church in your car. You got chill bumps running all over you. Texting Leslie, I got a song. She's like, that's awesome. Right? Okay. Yeah. That's just for you and Jesus. All right. <laughs> Number three. So you got to adore, right? You all right? So absorb the word. Adore. Adore the Lord with praise. Number three, apply. Apply the attitude of gratitude. Now we're going to get real practical here, but listen. Apply that attitude. Apply the posture of heart to your life where it's not just staying in your heart, it's moving out into your life. Whatever you do or say as a representative, did you know that God has ambassadors on the earth? God of the universe has ambassadors on the earth. You're it. You're an ambassador. You represent Jesus. That's why it's so frustrating when people call themselves Christians and they don't live like it. Why? Because they're representing him poorly. You are a representative of Jesus. Give thanks to him. Whatever you do, whatever you say, did you know that you are the thermostat of culture? You're not a thermometer. You're not just saying, oh, culture's bad. Culture's bad. Anybody can do that. But you've actually got the power inside of you to adjust culture, the external and the internal. You have control. Regardless of how bad our world is, God is good. Again, the melody in the moment. And when we focus on that, listen, it governs our decisions. Here's, here, here we go. Here's it laid out for you. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Not who, who is evil. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Well, I got to put myself first. That's the devil telling you that. The devil got evicted out of heaven. You know what, the, you know what he said seven times? I. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. How often? Never, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Oh. It's all in the context of gratitude. Bless those who persecute you. Woo. Bless and do not curse. You wouldn't believe. Bless and do not curse. But you don't bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who who rejoice and mourn with those that mourn. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be proud.
but be willing to associate with people of lower positions, of low positions. Do not be conceited. What does it look like? What does it look like to be possessed by a thank you? Number one, it looks like honor. It looks like honor. You know, Jesus lived his life honoring others. He honored this Pharisee, an unhonorable man. Jesus honored him. Jesus honored a woman, an unhonorable woman. I mean, last time I checked, prostitution wasn't on the list of honorable jobs. Yet Jesus honors this woman. See, your ability to honor others speaks more about your character, not always about the one that you're honoring. So don't get on Facebook and talk bad about people. I don't care who they are. You know what's annoying to me is, is people use like social media to blast people they don't know because they read something on the media. I'm like, you don't even know that person. Like we do it against politicians on both sides of the aisle. Come on. I mean, I have Republican friends that are like talk bad about the Democrats all the time. And I'm like, you don't even know them. How do you even know? And then definitely we have a lot on the other side, friends of mine also, that do the same thing. I'm like, what? You don't even know these people. Honor. Honor up. Honor down. Honor all around. Honor, honor, honor. Well, they're not worthy of honor. Awesome. Somebody needs to honor them. Then maybe they'll live up to it. Honor. Number two, humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That's what C.S. Lewis said. Love that quote. This is what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For the grace that has been given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Then he says this, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Don't be negative. Be sober. In other words, be objective. Humility. How many know that Jesus didn't just get his feet washed, he actually washed feet. There's not a more perfect picture of humility than Jesus, the God of creation that took on flesh to come down to wash the feet and remove the sins of humanity. Yet we can't be humble because someone else got a promotion that we wanted at work. Number three, be hospitable. Mm. I said it right, hospitable. Go out of your way to express kindness because Jesus went out of his way to express kindness. I mean, geographically, I don't know where heaven is, but I know it's a long way from earth. Well, it used to be until Jesus came. Come on. Jesus went out of his way. He was inconvenienced so that we could be better off. Listen, just some practical things of hospitality. Have manners. Have manners. Open doors for people right? Open doors for women and men and children. Who do I open the door for? Whoever's coming. Especially a woman, especially an older person. Say sir. Say ma'am. Don't call people older than you, dude. Bro. Don't do that. Have a, listen, have some hospitality. It's so annoying. Have some hospitality. Have, have a generous, be, have a hat in hand. Don't be disagreeable. Be accommodating. When you go to somebody else's house, I know I'm just like getting real practical. When you go to somebody else's house to eat, help do the dishes. Clean up after your kids. When you go to the restaurant, don't leave your table a mess. And tip your waitress well. Even Listen, even if he or she does a poor job, you tip them better because you don't reward them according to their service. You reward them because you're royalty. Well, I want them to learn a lesson. Come on, bro. Humble yourself. If you can't tip well, don't out, go out to eat or don't call yourself a Christian. Let's just be real. All right. There you go. All the waiters in the house. Yeah. <laughs> just be accommodating. Just have manners. Be nice. Why? Because you're grateful. Be warm. If you're if you're a, you got a colder personality, learn to be a warmer personality. Learn get around Pastor Nathan; he'll teach you how to be warm. I won't talk about the people that will teach you how to be cold because you don't need to learn that. <laughs> but don't be cold towards people. Don't be standoffish. I know it might not be the way that you were born, but you're becoming like Jesus. He's the standard. Jesus was warm and inviting. 
We can go on and on with manners. Let's just be real. All right, number four, celebrate with people. Celebrate with people. Celebrate with people. I think sometimes we, we talked about this at the men's gathering last night. Sometimes we won't celebrate a success in somebody else's life out of a poverty mentality, right? Because we're, we're, because it's something we want, so we don't celebrate it. And the reason is, is because we're afraid if they get it, I won't. It's lack. Listen, celebrate and pray for what you want in others. You watch your heart will change. And don't, listen, don't just rejoice at those who rejoice. And we've all had that before, right? Someone that's willing to weep with us but not rejoice with us, it's equally as frustrating. But I'd say we got to do both. We also got to be willing to weep with people. We also got to be willing to sit across the table and let tears roll out of our eyes as, as they're rolling out of their eyes and sit there and put our phones down, come on, for a few minutes and sit across the table and sympathize with somebody. This is what the great big thank you looks like. I'm just so grateful I can be here with you. I'm so thankful that I have the luxury of knowing you and listening to you and walking you through your struggles because someone did it for me. Sometimes the only person that did it for me was Jesus, but thank God I've had other people that have done it that Jesus was just living through. And number five is forgiveness, exercising forgiveness. See, some of you today, you have offense in your heart towards people. You carry around unforgiveness. You carry around bitterness in your heart. Can I tell you today, that's doing so much damage to your heart. Jesus wants you free from that. That is the posture of bondage. I'd encourage you to go to that person and say, listen, I need to forgive you. I've been, I've been dwelling on this thing that you did me, for, to me when I was eight years old, and I just want to tell you that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins. And I, I, and I want to tell you today, I'm not here to tell you that just you did me wrong, but I'm here to tell you that I've been harboring all this hardness towards you, and I want to let you know that I forgive you. Well, they didn't ask for an apology. It doesn't matter. That's not the condition. Live unoffendable. Man, would that be, what, what salt and light it would be if we were a people, the people of God would, be, would not be able to be offended. Wow. How much good would we be for the world? Live in harmony with one another. I've got a project for you. So in your seat back, there's a card. It says thank you on it. It's a thank you card. We've had these out the whole series. So I know Thanksgiving is on Sunday, but I want you to take a week. And every day, just take that card with you today. And every day, I just want you to write down two statements on that card. This is all repeated in the app. Two things. God, I'm thankful that you are forgiving. I'm thankful that you are sovereign. I'm thankful that you are kind. An attribute of God. And then take another statement every day. Just spend a couple minutes just writing that down. Maybe in your prayer time. Maybe you don't have a prayer time. This would be a great time for you to start it. And the other thing is just say, Lord, I'm thankful that blank is in my life. I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful that I have a heater in my home. I'm grateful that I have a car in my garage. I have a house for my car and a house for me, right? I'm grateful for the things in my life, the provisions. And just write that down every day in the next seven days. And so go through Thanksgiving. What do I want you to do on Thursday? Listen, I think you, by practicing this, I think you're going to learn. You're going to see more peace. You're going to see more. Some of you will see more peace in your life over the next seven days than you ever had. And it doesn't mean your situation is going to change. It's just going to mean that you've changed. And on Thanksgiving at lunch or supper, whenever you do it, I want you to just pull out that card that you've been carrying around in your back pocket all week. And say, hey, can I have y'all's attention for just a minute? Pastor Josh made me do this. So, right? We were doing this project at church, and the pastor just encouraged me to, to share what I'm grateful for. And I just want you to read those four, those five things off that list that you've got through so far. Just say, I just want to share that I'm grateful that God is a good God. He gave us Jesus. You see, you don't have to get all preachy. You can just say that once, and you just read it verbatim. I am thankful for God. Right? However, and I'm grateful for God's provision in my family. I'm thankful for my wife. 
and just share those two things just with your family or, or the, the, through the five days just say I'm thankful that God is just go through that list you don't have to take a lot of time but I would encourage you to do that just express in word and deed in word and deed and then just finish that up next Sunday and we'll come back and worship together and have a new series